So I have no disclosures. So the first point to make is SCAD is different to atherosclerosis. And the majority of SCAD, maybe three quarters of patients with spontaneous dissection have an isolated intramural hematoma. So here's an OCT of this patient on the top right. This is a lumen here, completely free of atherosclerosis. And this is this great big collection of bleeding in the media. And you see how thin the intermedial membrane is over here. In this particular patient, they actually had a, a flap as well, just where the arrows are. And you can see this communication, this decompression compressive communication between the media and the lumen. So intramural hematoma and intimal flap. And if, if you take this into your mind, this will set the stage for understanding revascularization strategies and SCAD. So if I, I could summarize, though, the one liner to remember is that if the vessel is major and occluded, it's worth opening it up, otherwise managed conservatively. This is the way we've been practicing for the last few years, and that's based on experience and data generated by us and others. But I will say it's not so straightforward in 2019. There are nuances that we must consider. So why do we consider conservative therapy as the mainstay of uh, treatment in SCAD? Well, this is a patient here who had an ugly, ugly left main SCAD. You can see here at baseline, she had uh, coronary bypass surgery, and a year later had a repeat angiogram. And look at that left main. That's incredible how the healing has taken place over here. And the lemur is, of course, occluded because the native vessels, vessel healed. And the question was, well, if this is the late natural history, if the vessel is going to heal, did she really need bypass in the first place, or could she just be managed conservatively? Well, let me show you this patient. Another left main into LAD, intramural hematoma, Timmy 3 flow. She was managed conservatively. You know, very reasonable to do that, I think. But six days later, after leaving hospital, she came in with a big anterior myocardial infarction. The LAD is occluded. The left main and the circ have worsened. She did survive after undergoing emergency coronary bypass grafting with an EF of 20% at dismissal. So conservative therapy did not work in this patient. And that raises the question, what is the risk of conservative therapy in SCAD? We all have this monosynaptic reflex of SCAD and conservative therapy, but we must recognize there's this risk. And this is that some of our work. We believe there's an early risk of about 15 to 16% of serious acute deterioration. So if you manage your patient conservatively, the risk period here is in the first few days of serious extension, just like that last case I showed you, of, uh, of worsening of spontaneous dissection. And who is at risk? Well, it's interesting that those who are at particular risk are those who have an intramural hematoma alone. In fact, if an intimal tear is present at baseline, that appears to confer some protection against a SCAD worsening, suggesting that that intramural hematoma is pressurized and can cause worsening luminal compression over the first few days. So high risk in the early period. What else do we know about PCI for SCAD? Well, we all know there's a high risk of complications. Uh, I'm sure your experience is that way. Several series have shown that. And now that we've learned so much more, if I could give one message about PCI and SCAD, perhaps the most important lesson to, to remember is that pain with normal flow may not be ischemic pain. So aortic dissection is painful, right? Carotid dissection is painful, but this is not ischemic. It's not brain ischemia, it's not aortic ischemia. It's pain from the dissection. So don't be arm twisted into diving in with your PCI equipment if the flow is normal and the patient is having pain. I think PCI should be done when the flow is down or when you're clearly convinced that the pain is ischemic. Coronary dissection can be painful from the wall. So I just thought I'd run through very quick lessons about PCI for SCAD based on some experience more than data. So intramural hematoma that we discussed at baseline behaves differently to plaque. So here's an example of spontaneous dissection of the mid-LAD over here. The patient had a balloon and stent placed. And what had happened here, you now see stents have been placed and there's complete occlusion of the LAD because the hematoma has been pushed downstream, the dissection has spread distally. And we went from a stable situation now to an anterior myocardial infarction. Lesson number two, if you're going to do IVUS, you need to be familiar with the findings. Here's a patient who came in with, with a, a funny looking uh, inferior right coronary lesion at the top over here, and an IVUS was done. And I think you would sympathize with someone that says, gosh, that looks like a plaque rupture. Right, it kinda does. But actually it's not a plaque rupture because if you look at the internal elastic lamina over here, the problem is outside of the internal elastic lamina. It's in the media slash adventitia. So this cannot be plaque. Plaque is a subintimal process, right? So this is an intramural hematoma and dissection. And if this was recognized in the situation of Timmy 3 flow, maybe they wouldn't have put in a stent and have this similar propagation of intramural hematoma downstream. So recognition of basic principles of IVUS I think is critical in SCAD management. Lesson number three is to be beware of uh, ent wire entry into the false lumen. 
Here's a case over here of a mid to distal LED diffuse narrowing. And you can see um, uh, in the next here, there's some uncertainty as to where this wire might be. Unfortunately, this wire was not in the true lumen, and we know that because when stents were placed, they actually were placed in the false lumen. So again, you have complete occlusion of the vessel because stents had closed the false lumen where the wire had been. Lesson number four is to know when to quit. So here's a, a case of a 42-year-old female with really uh, terrible, terrible uh, LAD, uh, ugly looking LAD, and they, they stented this, and this looks fantastic, right? Outstanding result with PCI. The patient was still having pain, although the flow is completely normal. And they looked at this, I think, very understandably, said, well, gosh, she's still having pain. Let me just uh, take a look at that diagonal over there with a wire or IBIS. And you see what happened here. The wire is in a side branch, and now we have a guide dissection of the left main. Just watch this again. You see a blowout, sock blowout, and no flow into the LAD. So the pain in that case was almost certainly non-ischemic. It was probably residual pain from the vessel wall. And knowing when to quit, I think, is, is the critical point over here. So they did, they did a great job. This is IVUS of the false lumen. Here's the true lumen parallel to the IVUS. And they were able to negotiate a wire back into the downstream stents. They put stents in here, mostly in the false lumen, lost a few septals, but got a, a really great rescue from a, a high-risk outstanding a, a complication there. Lesson number five, we often hear, well, gosh, if this is a dissection, maybe we can just seal the entry and exit points. But that may not make sense. And I'll show you that here. This is an intramural hematoma of the proximal LAD. You see the hematoma causing a compressive narrowing over here. This was managed conservatively. The patient the next day had more pain. And what's happened here is there's now been development, evolution into long intimal tear down the LAD, but the flow is normal. So this was all stented. Really fantastic sealing. Fantastic sealing of this LAD. But look what happened the next day. There's accumulation of hematoma upstream of those stents. So the stents have now sealed the exit from this intramural hematoma accumulation. So now you have extension back into the left main, into the proximal vessels, and the patient underwent coronary artery bypass grafting. So sealing was not the correct strategy there. Other quick stent issues, you see here's an example of resorption of hematoma, and hematoma does resorb, and you have a floating stent now on the LAD. Look at that, how often do you see that? Because we tend to undersize in the setting of hematoma, diffuse narrowing, you're going to undersize your stent, and this is a late a consequence of that. Another consequence is we know these vessels are very tortuous. You can get reconfiguration of a long stented segment, high risk of stent fracture, and resinosis. This was a terribly complex resinotic patient over here. The final lesson is remembering in SCAD the goal is to restore flow, and you do not need stents to restore flow. PTC alone can be a great option. In my view, it is the preferred option. Here's a mid-LAD occlusion, anterior STEMI from SCAD. Balloon angioplasty was done. This is the patient experiencing V-fib after balloon angioplasty. And this is the final result. You see good flow down here, a ripped intima all the way down to the apex. This is an outstanding result in SCAD. The NHLBI criteria will call this a PCI failure because of residual dissection. I call this an incredible success. You do not need to stem this. The patient will do very well. So final uh, um, conclusions here, remembering that pain may be from the vessel wall and PCI can be avoided sometimes. Conservative therapy is reasonable in many, but you need to observe the patient in hospital for that risk of extension. PTC alone for flow restoration may well be enough. Stents can work, but they can carry unique and unpredictable risks. Thank you for your time. Uh, no, go. It's little, um, Rajib, stay. So, any questions from the panel? R Rajib, very nice presentation. A couple of, co couple of questions. One is the, regarding the, uh, you were showing some OCT images, in the, and I know there's some debate about the role of OCT and injecting, if you have a dissection. Uh, what is your thought uh, on, on OCT intracoronary imaging? Yeah, so, intravascular imaging in SCAD, I think, is very, very rarely needed. I've shown you some cases. We've uh, now got 1,100 in our SCAD series. 20 have had OCT. So incredibly rarely needed. I think the only time it should be done is when there's genuine uncertainty and you believe you're all experienced cardiologists. You know when you can wire and, and inject safely. And that's why in those 20 that were done, there have been no complications. So I think you have a pretty good sense of when, when you can do this. And the other thought, I'm not sure, I mean, uh, for if, if there's sig significant intramural hematoma, 
know the section and let's say there were significant ischemia or symptoms, is there a role for, for cutting balloons or, or just to decompress the hematoma? Yeah, decompressive balloon angioplasty, I think, is, is a very reasonable uh, thing to do. I will say that the intermedial membrane in the hematoma is so thin, you just have to touch it with a regular balloon and that will they'll tear that area. I don't think you need blades. I think blades are probably overkill in this situation. I'm sure they work just like they do in atherosclerotic hematoma, but, but unnecessary in SCAD. So, so the cases you showed, that these are people that knowingly went after it when they already made a diagnosis that this was SCAD, right? That was purpose, or they, they were inadvertent and they, they missed the diagnosis and then they, they realized in retrospect. I think you raise an incredibly important point, Mauricio. I don't know for those, each of those individual cases, but quite not infrequently the diagnosis is made in hindsight in that, oh my gosh, this was a young woman who had this, and then she may have a recurrent SCAD three years later, and you figure out episode one was SCAD. I can't yep. give you a percentage. We're getting better recognition these days for some of the older cases, for sure. I'm sure I've missed cases from back in the day. But of young that's a point, right? You are called from the ED with, some, for, with somebody who's having an acute coronary syndrome, no cardiovascular risk factors, no events, nothing. I mean, so, so you have to have a, some, some degree of suspicion when taking this patient to the cath lab. 100% agree, yeah. Oh, thanks. The one, uh, as you mentioned, cutting balloon. The other thing is if you have to extend, uh, you ought to be at least four or five millimeters proximal and distal to the area that you want. So Dr. Jacqueline saw, it really showed that you really need to cover both ends uh, to make sure there's no internal tearing. And the other point was about using vein grafts if you have to send the patient to bypass. Most of the time, as you uh, said, there are um, younger patients, they will heal up. And uh, we had cases that we end up actually sending to surgery and the surgeon used vein graft. And I think, I mean, there's no biggest study, but that would be a good thought. So we don't touch the lima in case if the patient, you know, graft goes down, at least they don't lose their lima. Yeah, I, I got to take your second first. I completely agree. So we have a 20 sub-series of patients who went to bypass surgery for SCAD, and they all survived hospitalization. Those who had a relook, the majority of grafts were occluded. So I agree with you. The, the goal of bypass in SCAD is to get them out of trouble, so protect them for the first few weeks, you know, the left main risk. But after that, don't expect the grafts to stay open and save the lemur for when they're 70 and when they're needed. I agree. As to your first point about stenting, no one knows what the right stenting strategy is. It kind of makes sense to keep it longer to minimize the risk of that toothpaste thing, but gosh, I, I don't know if we can come out with uh, rules regarding that. So my, my last question, uh, a little bit on the side, you've been taking care of patients with uh, SCAD, so these are usually uh, young females that are caught in the middle of, in the middle of their life with these life-threatening complications. So what about support, social media? So what have you done in that uh, regard to support all these uh, mostly women that experience this uh, catastrophic uh, disease? Yeah, I think that this has been a huge success for social media, and, and uh, I don't think we as physicians could take the credit. It's the women who experience SCAD that really should take the credit. One of my colleagues, Sharon Hayes, has kind of been leading the uh, charger with this, but really it's the patients themselves that found each other on Facebook a few years ago, spread the word, and it's become an incredible social network. And I think your, your point about this being uh, young women uh, having uh, this disease is important because these are not just young women, they're young women who have zero risk factors. And so to be blown away then by having a heart attack, you can imagine the psychological impact. Yeah, it's called the SCAD Alliance, right? Yep, SCAD, SCAD Alliance. There's, many, there's se several, several uh, uh, SCAD groups out there, for sure. So, so Poonam has one so last question. Great, uh, great presentation. Two questions. Uh, oh, there, there's so a question in the back. So we have time. What, what do you do with these patients in terms of medical management? What do you tell them after the first episode uh, so to prevent recurrences? And two is, do you bring them back for routine uh, angiography in all these patients? Or, or how do you... Yeah, great question. The last one, we don't do routine angiography these days. Uh, I would say when we were get first, we don't recommend it when we were first kind of trying to figure this out, didn't know what to do, not infrequently you'd take a look again. The occasional time we'll do a relook is for when there's a genuine diagnostic dilemma and you need to know, you can't tell, you're looking at that first angiogram that someone sent you, we'll say, well, gosh, if, if you relook and if there's healing, that will maybe give you an idea of a scan. So it's a, it's a rare case we do that. Medical therapy, it's very little. There's no, never going to be a randomized trial, but I'll tell you what we do is we give it single antiplatelet therapy, so aspirin alone. Beta blockers based on some retrospective data for low risk of recurrence, although that's controversial. And we avoid statin in normal uh, lipids. Again, that's based on our controversial low sample size retrospective data suggesting a higher risk of problems in those who are on statins.
So, so Rajiv, uh, first of all, congratulations for doing an amazing work and clarifying this field. It's still very confusing for many of us. And we all had cases where you start doing something and then you d dissect everything, ECMO in the unit, EF 20%. A couple of questions. One is about radial versus femoral. And obviously, you are one of the world experts on radial as well. But I've heard that femoral might be preferred for this one, so you have less chance of dissecting the ostium. And uh, the second question about statins. Do you give statin to these people if there is no clear atherosclerosis? How, what do you handle that? Yeah, thanks, Manuel. Great points. I'll take your second question first. So do you give statins? We, we do not typically give statins if the lipids are normal, but if there's dyslipidemia, we do give it. And the reason for not giving it is there's some weak retrospective data suggesting a higher risk of not on statins. But we'll add to that saying, well, gosh, where's the evidence for atherosclerosis? There is none. And there's certainly no evidence for benefit. So we would, we would take the position of not giving statins the, the lipid are normal. Femoral versus radial. This is a hot topic of discussion here, but I'll, I'll let you and uh, Maurizio fight this out. But I think... Um, the concern we initially had with radial was if you're ever so slightly off with your coaxial alignment, these vessels are super fragile and very prone to catheter-induced dissection. So I would try and give you a, an even-keeled response that radial is okay, femoral is okay, but you'd be darn sure you got coaxial alignment and take yeah, as few I think you got to do what you feel comfortable with. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Rajiv. So.